out. So I, I see it on Facebook Live there. So I think we're going good. Okay, I got that going. I think everything's going good now. Oh, hey, Alan, hope you're doing well. Yeah. Okay, I think we're going good now. Hey, welcome, everybody. Uh, I am coming to you live from Hackberry Farm in Dodge City, Texas. My name is Russell Graves. If you've been here before, you know, we always try to have a lot of fun on these webinars. If you haven't been here before, uh, welcome. And just to kind of give you the groundwork of how things work, I like these conversations to be a, a, a dialogue and not a monologue. So as I go through these things, uh, feel free to, to chime in. Really, you know, the whole title of this webinar speaks for itself. This is, uh, there's a few debatables in here. I've got four main points I'm going to try to make today and tell you my thoughts on them. And uh, I'd love to hear what everyone else thinks in terms of uh if the, how they use in terms of what they think about the various topics that I'm going to cover today. Uh, but again, as we go through, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to, to uh, ask them and, and uh, I'll be sure to answer them. So I think I've got everything set up like I need it. It looks like it is. And again, today's uh, topic is back button focus, exposure mode and other photography debatables. And here's the key part in wildlife photography. And, uh, I, you know, I was got to thinking about, do, should it be nature photography? But I think in this instance, especially something like back button focus, really only applies to, to uh, wildlife photography. So I kind of limited the things we're going to talk about around the wildlife photography genre. But some of the lessons I'm going to talk about today can also be extended to, you know, macro photography or nature photography or any other kind of uh, discipline within the or what landscape photography and any other kind of discipline within the nature photography realm. So uh, I would be uh, pretty excited to hear what you guys think and what, about what I have to say today. And again, this is all in, in good fun and good spirit. I'm not anything I say today. I'm not trying to demean anybody. Cause I think if you've heard me say it before, photography is supposed to be fun. It's not like I'm solving world hunger by pressing a button on a camera. I do it for the love of image making. I think that's why you do it as well. And so anything I say today, uh, take it with a grain of salt, because here's the really the best lesson I'm going to teach you today. This morning, I tried to figure out how long would it take for me to go from my house to a little resort town that I absolutely love going to called Broken Bow, Oklahoma. And this is what Google Ma or this is what Apple Maps showed me today. It gave me three different choices. I could take the fastest route, the fewest turn route or this alternate route. And it doesn't matter if I'm trying to get there fastest or not. It's just showing me that. But here's the key part and how this applies to photography. No matter where I start and which route I take or which way I try to, to make the, an image, it always gets me to the same place. And that, you know, here in Texas and I think in other parts across the South, we always talk about there's a there's a million different ways to skin a cat. Or in photography, it's the same thing. I can talk about what I like to do and it may be relevant for me, but it's relevant for me. It may not be relevant for you. But if you're kind of on the fence and you're learning like a lot of people, uh, sometimes they like to hear someone's opinion about how they do things and why they do things and uh, and and clearly articulate why they pick a certain uh, priority mode that they use or whether they use back button focus or not or some of the other things we'll talk about today. Uh, sometimes they like to hear that. So that's what this is given in the spirit of. I'm not, again, not trying to to criticize anyone for the choices they make because like this map shows, if we're trying to get to Broken Bow, Oklahoma, or Broken Bow, Oklahoma represents a a, uh, a well-exposed, in-focus picture, there's multiple ways to get there. So that's in the spirit of that. That's that's where I'll start. So I'm going to start with the first one. And this is a question I get a lot, especially out in the field. Are tripods and wildlife photography outdated? Because we've got all this technology built into cameras. We've got in lens stabilization, which has been around for quite a while now. I'm trying to think when I first saw in lens stabilization come around. I, I know it's been around for at least 20 years, uh, or at least I think it's been around for at least 20 years, 15 to 20 years that that technology has been around, where you can, where the image has the uh, motors inside that help, or where the lens has the motors inside that help stabilize the image. And uh, it, you know, at first it was a it was a real big breakthrough because it would help you handhold a can a a, a lens and body combination two to three stops lower than what you normally could. You know, the old rule in photography, and we talked about this last week on our trip to the Smoky Mountain, the old rule in photography is that you should never handhold 
or say you should never handhold below what your lens size is should match the closest shutter speed you can. So in other words, if you're using a 500 millimeter lens, I should never try to handhold that lens at anything less than one five hundredth of a second. If you're shooting a 100 millimeter lens, one one twenty fifth of a second is the lowest shutter speed you can safely handhold that. And uh, in body stabilization changed that a little bit, but that's still a pretty good rule to go by. So begs the question are tripods. Oh, and, and the second thing with in body stabilization now, uh, they offer three to five stops more stabilization. So with the right lens and and uh, and camera combination, you can get as many from five as many as five to eight stops slower shutter speeds. Theoretically, that can, you can use and be able to handhold that. I know uh, what Canon's doing is pretty remarkable. I don't know so much about Nikon. I'm not saying they, they're not doing anything remarkable in terms of lens and in body stabilization, but uh, in Olympus, I've used Olympus before, and they do it really nice job of in-body stabilization as well as the lens stabilization so but it goes back to the question are tripods in photography wildlife photography outdated my response is i don't think they are i think that the using a tripod are one of those fundamental things that when you're learning photography if you use it and use it all the time it's going to make a big difference in how sharp your images are going to be and I, I, I hear people say a lot that, well, they're cumbersome to use, they're unwieldy, they take a while to set up. And all that's true. But if you just get in that muscle memory where you can you can get where you can set one up pretty quick. And one of the tricks I do is if we're driving down the road and we see a bear, I, I don't look at the animal while I'm trying to set up the tripod. I feel like I, I fumble less and get it set up quicker. And in the end, if I'm not looking at what I'm about to take pictures of, if it does something really cool, I can't miss what I never saw. So that's one of the internal things I do in my mind while I'm setting up a tripod. And so, again, even in low light, because one of the things you can't control, even, even though you got in-body stabilization, that's counting on you being really, really, really still. And for some of us, that's kind of hard to do, especially if you're holding, a, a, like I've got a 500 millimeter F4 lens. If you're holding a 500 millimeter F4 lens, that's a heavy, it's a pretty heavy beast. And it's hard to handhold. So, again, I always recommend using a tripod every chance you get. Uh, this gray neck. All, the, all these pictures, by the way, you're seeing in this presentation were taken on recent backcountry journeys trips. So if you have any questions just about the pictures, let me know that as well, too. And I'm looking at this. Uh, I'm looking at our numbers we have today. And uh, we've got a pretty good crowd in here today. So Rob asked a question. Do you turn off in-body stabilization at higher shutter speeds, 1250 plus? I don't necessarily turn it. I, I really don't turn it on unless I think I really need it. But usually, even the lens stabilization, I don't necessarily turn it off. I've never seen any detriment when you put when you use the stabilization on a tripod. And so it seems to work well in concert together. I know you read different things and some people will tell you to turn it off. Some people will tell you to leave it on. My personal thing is I don't want to take the time to go through all the menus and turn off the in-body stabilization. Uh, the lens stabilization is easy enough to turn off, but still using on a tripod, I haven't seen any kind of detrimental effect. So hope that answers your question, Rob. Uh, and so here's what I call, I came up to, with this, what I call the support hierarchy. And so this is, to, in my mind, this is the, the, uh, the best support to the least best support that you can you can use. And so obviously the best support you can use, the most stable is going to be a tripod. And these are commonly, by the way, these are commonly available available items that you can get. I know you could probably build a four-legged pod and or quad pod and have it even steadier, but these are, I'm talking about things that are easy to obtain. So on the support hierarchy, use a tripod first if you can. Second thing I really like using, especially when I'm driving around or if I'm shooting out in the field, and I need something to support. I use one of those bean bags. I've got the product I use is made here in Texas. It's called a molar bag, and you just fill it full of uh, full of dried beans or or corn, dried corn, something like that. And the whole point is, remember the old bean bags you used to sit on in your in your house back in the seventies. It's kind of back in in your college dorm back in the seventies and eighties. It's kind of the same thing. It just kind of form fits around your camera and uh, helps keep it steady when a tripod is not available. Again, beanbag, I use that. Uh, depending on what kind of photography I'm doing, I do a lot of, a lot of times I'll wake up in the morning and just drive around country roads. And when I'm doing that, I'll use the beanbag as support, whether on the top of my hood, the, the 
the bed of my pickup or just out the window. It's really invaluable. Uh, I would say the next thing in the support hierarchy would be a monopod. Uh, monopods are, are great choices. One of the things that I, one piece of advice I give a lot when we're traveling to uh, uh, Katma when weight is an issue on the backcountry journeys tours is if, if you've got a monopod, a monopod's a pretty good choice to bring if you want to save weight over a tripod. And that's usually what I do because the tripod I've got, I've got a really right stuff set of legs and I've got a really right stuff uh, ball head. And for my big lens, I've got a, 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 I'm going blank on the, who the manufacturer is, but I've got a gimbal head. So together that gimbal head along with the uh, legs, you know, it, it's going to be at least, uh, I'm going to say close to 10 pounds of weight. And so when you've got a limited amount of weight you can take, I'll leave that tripod at home and use a monopod. And a monopod is a great way that you can keep the, keep those big lenses steady. And also you can lean that monopod against a rail, against a tree or something else to give you even more support. So monopod is a great choice if you don't have one of those. Uh, other bracings like a tree or a rock, you know, if, if I can, if, if I can't use a tripod and I don't have a bean bag and I don't have a monopod heavy, it's action happen really quick. The next thing I do is look for some kind of bracing. We were in the Smokies last week to to talk about that trip a little bit. We saw some bears out in the field. And uh, when I first saw the bears, I thought they were going to leave. So I got out of the vehicle, and the first thing I did was look for some kind of support. Well, there, the support was a fence post. And so I laid my camera on top of the fence post to try to get as steady as I could. Now, the bear didn't leave as quick as I thought it was going to, so I had time to go out and get my tripod. But when I when my tripod is not necessarily a choice when you're trying to go really quick, other kind of bracing like a tree or a rock. And then from there, when we start talking about handheld, handheld prone or where you're laying down like a rifleman, uh, like the old green army figures that I used to play with when I was a kid, you'd always have a guy laying down shooting from the prone position. Handheld prone is the best way after that to hold your big lens and your camera steady. Handheld sitting is the next solid way to take pictures. And then I know a lot of people don't want to hear this, but handheld standing is the least steady way to hold a big lens, a telephoto lens and a uh, camera whenever you're, whenever you're uh, taking pictures. And the reason why, if you think about all the points of movements that can possibly move, if you think about the camera in your hand and all the joints in your fingers and all the joints in your wrist, elbows, shoulders, down through your back, through your hips, down through your legs and knees, I, I don't know how many joints that is, but it's a ton of them and every one of those joints are moving in concert trying to keep it steady. And, but because of that, everything's moving and you, you just, it's impossible for us to stand perfectly still. A tripod can stand perfectly still, but a uh, handheld standing is the least steady way to support a telephoto lens and a camera. Now, does that mean you can't take sharp pictures like that? Absolutely not. But if your goal is to shoot more and more and more pictures uh, that are, that are always in focus and always sharp, then you got to think about this hierarchy that we talk about. Uh, someone asked the question, is that why my standing handheld shots of bear is just a fraction soft? Probably because, you know, as again, as you move, even though the technology is great, the technology can't account for all the nuances in everybody's movements. And so it's kind of going to average out that movement. The easy thing to do is don't worry about all that stuff default to a tripod or one of these first few things in a, in a support hierarchy. Now I'll be the first to admit I take some of my pictures handheld. Sometimes there's no choice, but if given a choice, I'm going to find something to support that camera with. All right. That's the first thing. And in between, I like showing pretty pictures of the, well, I take it back. I did not take these white tailed deer pictures on a backcountry journeys trip. They were all shot around here by me. So. Uh, but the alligator was shot on a BCJ's Florida trip. The landing pelican was a BCJ's trip. Uh, and, and even these, the the uh, uh, pelican was not shot on a tripod because we we're in a boat when we took that, but I did use a monopod. Here's another debatable, number two. And as I go, again, if you have any questions or comments, uh, let me know. I'll be sure to read them live as we go through there, these uh, different things we're talking about. And the best exposure mode, I get this question a lot too. What's the best exposure mode to use? Well, if you reference the, the map from this very second slide I showed you, there's really not a best. I mean, it, best is kind of a subjective term. It's really what works in that scenario and it really what ultimately what works for you. 
again, let me double down on this one. I'm not trying to change anybody's mind. If, if, if what you do works for you, great, because what I'm explaining today is what works for me. But if you're trying to learn what something that may work best for you and sort of a best practices, that's what we're talking about today. So the best exposure mode. Well, let's go through a rundown. By the way, I love this picture here. It looks like they just got out of the, the beauty salon and they're showing off their haircuts. These are reddish egrets that we saw in the Dean Darling National Wildlife Refuge. And they're not a they're not a rare bird, but they're not super common there either. But we saw those guys there and we watched them and photographed them hunting in that in that uh in that wetland for probably 30 minutes. And it was pretty, pretty awesome. Yep, heading to a rave. That's what they're doing. So a rundown of the of the typical exposure modes that almost every camera has. And you know, here's the thing about cameras that you got to remember. Whether you're talking about Olympus or Nikon or Panasonic or Canon or Sony or Rick, well, is Rico even a brand anymore? I can't remember. Or, or I'm going blank on any other ones. All these cameras are pretty much, they all do the exact same thing. They just call the different modes a little bit different thing and the buttons are in a different place. But essentially, they all do the same thing in the same way. And so a lot of times when I'm, I use Canon. So a lot of times when I'm talking about some of these concepts, I'm really referring to what I know best. And that's the Canon. Uh, and so uh, that that's what I'll, I'll use to explain here. I've got another question coming in. I'll ask here in just a second, Stephen. So we've got, here's a rundown of the various exposure modes. We've got program mode or P is what it's called on a lot of cameras. And that's where the camera sets the aperture and the shutter speed for you. That's the, that's the setting that people use when they really don't know how to manipulate anything on their camera. And we've all been there before, but they set it on program mode and let the camera make all the decisions for them. And then we have shutter priority mode. You set the shutter speed and the camera sit, sets the aperture. And so, again, when you set on the shutter priority, you set the shutter speed. You dial in what shutter speed you want. The camera matches it with the aperture. Uh, or the aperture priority mode. You set the aperture and then the camera sets the shutter speed. It's, it's the exact opposite of the shutter priority mode. And then, of course, you've got manual. Uh, I should have rearranged those because those spell spam if you look at it. S-P-A-M. Or you use manual and you set the aperture and the shutter speed yourself. And so those are the two legs of the, uh, those are two of the legs of the exposure triangle. The last one's ISO. I'll be getting the ISO here in a little bit, by the way. And before I go further, Stephen asked the question, uh, shutter speed not really important in handheld. Uh, it is, Stephen, if I understand your question correctly, it is important in handheld, but Again, if you use a tripod and you think about that support hierarchy I talked about, the steadier you can keep the camera, the more forgiving shutter speed can be in, in, in some of these photography scenarios. Like this picture here was taken of these of these reddish egrets. This picture was probably taken in, in uh, I'm going to say at 930 in the morning, something like that. I could have shot this picture at very first light when the very first hints of orange were coming out. Uh, I don't know that I could have got a sharp sh shot handheld. But I know I could have gotten one with a tripod, even though we should, the shutter speeds would be a lot lower. Uh, and then Kathy asked, recently I've been with guides that recommend auto ISO, pros and cons of this. I'll be getting to that, Kathy, on the auto ISO here in just a second. So that's one of the debatables that we're going to talk about today. So if you'll bear with me, I'll, I'll get, get with you on that. And just in speaking with ISO, you know, these cameras we use today have a capability of doing really, really high ISOs. But from a from a photography fundamental standpoint, they still perform best at low ISOs. And so even though you could outrun the shut, if you're trying to do handheld, you could jack the the uh, the ISO way up to, you know, 10,000 or, or 12,500 or wherever. And be able to have a really fast shutter speed in the lowest light of conditions. But your image quality will, will suffer because... Even some of these newer cameras like my Canon R5 at 3200 ISO, you still see a lot of noise in the image. And uh, and so I try to limit my ISO to sweet spots for between four and 800 is what I try to limit it between. I think it, the camera performs best and the image quality is best in that range. And uh, it's a good trade off between maybe a little bit of noise, but you can still get a high enough shutter speed. But again, uh, if you if you just try to eliminate handheld whenever possible and use some kind of support, your images will be better and you can shoot at lower and lower shutter speeds at lower ISOs. 
Let me make sure. Okay. Just a few more pictures. Uh, well, here's an example that blue wing teal that's printing itself in the upper right of the picture. I, that was shot at a, at, at like first light in the morning and it was really a backlit image and it was in a dark area and I, I couldn't have got that picture handheld. And so I used the tripod to be able to shoot at a pretty low shutter speed. And again, you can get by with lower shutter speeds, even with action that, uh, that, and still get sharp images. And then that's my yard coyote. My house was the blind when I shot that picture of the coyote. I was at my front door with the door open, laying on the ground when I shot that picture. And then those are frigate birds on the on the left. Uh, those are frigate birds on the left. You see, I just got a response in that said no sound. So if that's a, if anyone else hears that, let me know. As far as I know, people are hearing me. It looks like everything's working on my end. So just uh, let me know if that's an issue. So for me, I think aperture priority mode is the best. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Well, before I took, well, here's one reason. In wildlife photography, in my opinion, backgrounds are really, really critical. So you always want a good creamy background so that animal, uh, uh, that, so the animal stands off the page. And you can look at, if I go back, well, those aren't good examples. I'll show you some better examples in a minute. Okay, I'm getting reports that people can hear me. So uh, if you're having problems with that, I don't see that question now. I'm not sure who wrote it, but uh, okay, I'll just continue if everyone can hear me. So in wildlife photography, the and I talk about this a lot in, in past webinars as well as when we do some in-class stuff on backcountry journeys, uh, photo tours, that when you're talking wildlife photography, really that good, soft, out of focus, creamy background really looks best when you're, when you're trying to get the animal to stand out from the page. It's not always the case that you want to do it that way, but most of the time in my, in my uh, personal aesthetic, that's the way I like to look. And so for that to happen, you've got to sh shoot wide open or with the, the smallest number on your aperture. So with my 500 millimeter lens that I use so much for wildlife photography, I'm shooting it at f4 or f5.6. I'm opening the lens as wide open as I can get it because all I really care about is that little thin slice of space to be in focus. And that thin slice of space is where the animal is. Eyes got to be in focus. Doesn't matter if the beak or the nose or the front of the snout is particularly sharp. As long as the eyes in focus, you can get away with a little bit on the front and back of being not in focus. So the ideal is, is you want the background just to be completely blown out or bokeh is what the kids call it these days. Uh, you really want that to be blown out and, uh, and uh, okay, I just saw that question. It's the same guy saying there's no sound. So uh, Mark, if you can hear me, you might want to log out and log back in. That may fix it. Everyone else is reporting they can hear. But, and the second reason is I think after priority, priority mode is the best because it saves me time in the field because all I've got to do is worry about exposure compensation when needed. The aperture and the ISO is set and the camera decides what the shutter speed is going to be. So the three things that you use, the exposure triangle, the three things that's used to determine exposure, I'm presetting two of them and I'm letting the camera decide the third one. And so when I see something appearing fast, and if you do a lot of wildlife photography, you know that that's the way it happens. So in so Noel, if you ever come take bobcat pictures with me, or Beth, if you ever come take bobcat pictures with me, uh you got to be ready to go. And so I like setting aperture priority. I, I, there's a program on my computer I can use called photo statistica. And I did a webinar about this, I think back in the fall, but I mined all the data in my images to figure out the patterns in which I shoot. And I, and I knew I used aperture priority a lot, but of all the pictures I've ever taken 620,000 images in my catalog, 80% were shot on aperture priority. And that sounds like a beginner mode. Cause I know a lot of people will tell, tell you a lot of, uh, and I use experts in air quotes because I don't think any of us are really experts, but the experts will tell you that the only way to go is the manual mode and manual mode's good to know. But once you know it, if you're looking for speed and looking to save time, I think aperture priority is the best way to go. Cause again, I determine what the aperture is. I determine what the ISO is. And then the camera decides what the shutter speed is going to be. And all I've got to do is, uh, is, is just decide on what the uh, exposure compensation is going to be. And then we've got, got a few comments here. 
Bob says he thinks the mode depends on what shooting on what you're shooting birds in flight, animals moving using shutter priority, birds at rest, etc. Use after priority. And this is why we call it debatable, Mark, because that is debatable. Or Bob, I'm sorry, that is debatable. I, I think. If if you use good fundamental tech, uh, fundamental practices like using a tripod or using support after a priority, it for me works best all the time. Just because in the end, it really matters to me what the background looks like, and it matters to me all the time. Uh, and uh, just to if you don't know, if you haven't heard me talk about this, one of the things that drives my aesthetic is I shoot an awful lot of pictures for magazines, uh, and one of the things I'm always trying to do is get on every picture I take of wildlife is get the background out of focus. So that way the designers have a good clean place where they can lay text. And so that's kind of what drives that out of focus mentality for me. And I'm always thinking about that. So for me, I can shoot of all the pictures I took, I mentioned, I mentioned 80% were shot in aperture priority for me. I think that number is like 2% I've ever shot, shot in shutter priority. So my point is, It'll all get you to the same place. It's whatever works best for you, but I appreciate that comment, Bob. Uh, Steve says, do you prefer after priority for landscapes or manual given the difference? You know, if I use manual more than anything on any kind of photography, it's usually on landscape photography because you have time to set up and, and really dial in things in for the best sort of look. Use the tools your camera gives you like depth of field preview and all those other things. So since since landscape photography is a little bit slower discipline, I, I do use manual more often than not on that kind of photography. Uh, and Linda says, if you're shooting more than one animal, sometimes it's better to have a bit more depth of field so both are sharp. Don't disagree with that, Linda. One of the things I would add to that as well is, uh, is a lot of times what I try to do, and this is, again, a personal aesthetic, is I try to limb, I try to, find the best angle to be able to isolate one animal from the group as far as shooting instead of shooting a group of animal, but you're exactly right on that. Uh, Jeff says underwater manual is best due to strobe flash. Yeah. Underwater is a little bit different on that. Not, you know, everything I'm talking about, even though I've got a picture of a manatee, this is actually shot on, on a, on aperture priority just because the, the animals barely underwater. Uh, but yeah, you're exactly right on because you're using a strobe output and the light source is constant. Manual is better to use underwater. And that's uh, one of the roseate spoonbill that we saw in the Everglades. Those are beautiful birds. Okay, so I think it was Kathy that asked about auto ISO before. Should you use it? And if you don't know, auto ISO is a setting where the camera, you can set the aperture, say for example, in manual, you can set the aperture and the shutter speed and the camera will fluctuate the ISO based on the best settings for you. I'm not a fan of auto ISO. And the reason why is I know you can limit it to how high or how low it'll go. You can limit these cameras to how high or how low they'll go. But the thing is, you still got a range there. And this goes back in, in you know, look, maybe I'm old school because I've been shooting pictures for a long time and I started shooting pictures back when everything was filmed. And I guess it could be argued that I'm slow to adapt, but I'm just not a fan of auto auto ISO because it's, you know, if you're, sh if you're shooting, if you're so particular in shooting manual uh, with uh, by setting your, by, by making sure that you're setting your shutter speed and that you're setting your, your aperture, then it makes sense that you'd go ahead and just dial in your auto ISO. And so, that's one of the reasons. The second reason is if you shoot in a priority mode like I do most of the time, if you're trying to make those minute adjustments to exposure using that exposure compensation, then the auto ISO fights against you. So if you dial in a plus uh, one on your exposure compensation, the auto ISO tries to adjust accordingly. So essentially you're going to get the same exposure. And so that's why if you're using a priority mode, I just don't like the auto ISO to fight against me. I'll just set my my ISO at a, at a certain number. It's not hard to change if I need to, and so I don't really need the camera changing that for me. Again, when I shoot auto ISO, I mean, I shoot a static ISO, a static aperture, and then the, the thing that's the most dynamic that moves around is the shutter speed. And so with that discussion about 
what settings are changed the most? And this is a question that came up a couple of weeks ago with me. Uh, the settings that change the most on a camera is the after I change it the least. When I'm out shooting pictures of wildlife, I'm not trying to decide, should I shoot this at F8 or F16? I'm probably always going to shoot at F4 or F5.6. So the aperture is the setting that's going to change the least for me. The second setting that's going to change the least is going to be the ISO. Uh, and I see some new questions coming in, so I'll, I'll answer those in just a second. So the second setting that changes least for me is ISO. Like I mentioned, I'm pretty happy with where my cameras perform between four and 800. So my app, my, my uh, ISO is usually set at 400, just kind of my default. And if it gets lower and lower light, I may go to 640, 800. And I, I will shoot at a thousand ISO because the cameras are getting better, can handle that. But I try to keep it within that sweet spot all the time. And then the next thing that changes the most, because I do shoot on aperture priority mode so much, is the exposure compensation. And if you don't understand what exposure compensation is, if you, it's that plus and minus dial that's up by the shutter button on Nikon's Canon. You just roll the wheel on the back, and it'll move the move the uh, exposure compensation to the plus or minus. If you're using a uh, a priority mode, if you're using manual, you can do your own exposure compensation just by dialing in manual. And the reason for that is the cameras can't always get exposures right when you're in the field, particularly if you have a dark background or a light background. And I always use snow as an example. Everyone among us that shot pictures in the snow has taken pictures and the snow looks gray or muddy after you take the picture. It's not as white as you see it. And the reason for that is the camera can't meter that correctly, that bright scene. It just tries to push everything, you know, on the histogram towards the middle. And so you use exposure compensation to overcome that. I've got a whole other webinar that I've done in the past. If you want to look that up about how exposure compensation works. Uh, and then I may be doing that one again in the future on how exposure compensation works. But that's that's almost a webinar in itself on how to how that works and how to how to compensate for different uh, scenarios that you may see in the field. And then the thing that changes the most is the shutter speed, because, again, I shoot on aperture priority. I set my aperture static. I set the ISO mostly static. I may fiddle with the exposure compensation. And then the shutter speed is the thing that changes the most. So I, before I go to the next slide, I'll answer a few questions here. Let me see. Do you have an exposure mode preference if you're shooting a focus stack series of wildlife? Mark, I've never shot a focus stack series of wildlife. So I'm going to give you my email at the end of the, this presentation. And if you've done that before, I'd love to see what you're doing and uh, love to learn a little bit of something from you. So I appreciate that. I've just never done it before, so I don't really have a good answer for that one. There's that reddish egret hunting. They'll, what they'll do is they'll run around in the water and kind of flap their wings and, and create shade so they can create, it cuts the glare down off the water so they can see in it better. Linda asked the question, what is the target shutter speed for subjects like birds in flight? Really, for for me, is it's it's a little bit nebulous. I mean, I think if I look back at all the, it depends on what you what you like and what you want to get. If I look back at all my pictures, I, I've shot pictures of birds in flight at one sixtieth of a second. But you're you know you've got things on a tripod. Usually those are bigger birds because they've got a predictable uh, they've got a predictable path that they take and they're just easier to follow. But I, I would say if I was forced to have a, a, a minimum a target shutter speed for birds in flight, I would say it's one five hundredth of a second and above. And I think at that, you can almost always guarantee you're going to get, as long as your lens is, is focused on the bird, you're going to be able to get uh, most things in focus. The wingtips may be blurred a little bit. That doesn't bother me as long as the eyes are in focus. That's what I worry about. Uh, Jeff uh, says the focus stacking bracketing works well with snow and large mammals. So you can get some of the snowflakes in focus as well as the, the animal. It makes sense. I've just never done it before. So here's the big one, back button focus. And this is the one, I think this is the big debatable that uh, everybody talks about. Is it a good idea? Before I get into whether it's a good idea or not, and how, how's that for building suspense? What's back button focus, if you don't know, and this is a picture I took of the back of my one of my cameras this morning. On This is a Canon R5, but you can see that AF on. Back button focus is a, is a 
is a setting you can do on your camera where you have to press that back button to make the camera focus. You know, the alternative is that the that the uh, the shutter button you use your forefinger with has a dual mode where it'll focus and take the picture. But with back button focus, you you a lot of people will disengage the front button and make it just for the shutter, and then the their thumb becomes uh, their thumb becomes what focuses the camera. And so, uh, for me, and I and I've I've done it both ways, so I feel like I'm a I'm a little bit versed in this. Again, I wouldn't call myself an expert at it, but I'm a little bit versed in this. And so for me, back button focus is not a good idea because when you use a back button focus, you relegate your thumb to only a single function, and that's autofocus. And so like on the back of my camera, if I'm taking pictures and I want to, if I'm focused on, say, a deer and I want to dial in exposure compensation, what I've got to do is take my thumb off the back button focus and then reach down and use a dial on the back of my camera. Now, I know you can reprogram a lot of these things, but still... Uh, if, if I leave my camera set up default and I'm, I'll show you a picture here and I don't know if I can do this backwards, but there's the back button focus. If I'm using only that, my thumb for that, that takes me, that takes out my ability to use this toggle switch. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight different functions on my camera goes away because my thumb is relegated to just that. And so, and that may be because the way I learned was I, I like to have my, my, uh, my, my focus finger and trigger finger, finger be the same. So I, I'm, I'm using that shutter button for two functions, but I'm also leaving my thumb free to be able to manipulate anything else on the camera on the fly. And for that reason is why I'm not a big fan of back button focus. Uh, I've tried it before because there a few years ago when it first came out, it was kind of the rage for everybody. And for me though, for this one reason is you lose the ability because with wildlife photography, as you know, it, sometimes it's a matter of it's a matter of speed and it's a matter of seconds. That when when the the head just turns right or the ears go up or or its eyes are open or you've got that right amount of catch light in it, sometimes you're talking about a fraction of a second. And I like to be able to continue to stay in focus and barely have my finger on the shutter button and be able to manipulate things like exposure compensation or my tracking mode or my metering mode. I can do all that by looking through my camera using my thumb on the back of the camera. And if I'm using my thumb for only autofocus, then the autofocus goes away as soon as I take my thumb off that. Now, like I said, I prefer to leave my thumb free to control other aspects of the camera. Now, I won't take credit for this. This is a guest named Brian Hammerlink. I hope he doesn't mind me using his name. He's the one that told me he does this. On, on the depth of field button on these cameras, like right here by the lens, you can see in this picture I took, he actually uses that as his focus button. And so I think that's a good idea because of all the buttons on my camera, that one probably gets used the least. And so if I was going to try to be convinced to use a button other than my shutter button for focus, I think it would be that one right there. Now I say all that with, uh, you know, again, not trying to, I, you know, everything that that everything that, that's debatable in this presentation I've talked about today is all debatable, debatable from my point of view. Uh, if, if it's not just because it's not the way I do it, doesn't mean that somebody I'm going to pick on a few people here. doesn't mean that Jeff's doing it wrong. doesn't mean that Linda's doing it wrong. It's just the way I do it. Just like they do the things the way they do. And so, but the, the back button focus seems to be the big debatable in photography these days. But like I said, the reason why I don't use it is because I like my thumb being able to control all the other controls of the camera and not just be relegated to the back button focus. And I've never really heard anybody else talk about it that way. Uh, you know, most of the proponents just say, well, you got to use back button focus, but they, no one ever seems to talk about how you lose functions in your camera or you don't lose them. You, it makes it a little more cumbersome to make changes in your camera on the fly as opposed to just having that thumb free. So, I know on a lot of these newer mirrorless cameras, you can reprogram buttons on your cameras to do different things. I'm not sure about all the DSLRs, and I'm not sure if all, they'll all do that, but I know on my Canon R5, you can reprogram that button to change it from the depth of field to make it the lens focus. Because again, for me, this is for me, that's the least used button on my camera. I will, on landscape photography, 
I will use it from time to time, but in wildlife photography, I never use that. So, uh, the so got a couple of comments coming in. I like back button focus. If you want to focus and recompose, recompose, do you half press and recompose? Uh, if okay, I think I understand your question, Bob. You, you might want to you might want to clarify uh, that a little bit. But if I understand correctly, if you're using front button focus, do you half press and recompose? Yeah, it depends on the focus mode you use. Like in Canon, if you use AI servo or the continuous focus where it's always focusing, then you, you're just wherever you you can in the in the, in the, the uh, eye tracking view, wherever you recompose to, it's going to just automatically focus. You don't have to necessarily take your thumb off this off the focus and to recompose it at all. Uh And then uh, Jeff says, one reason I've read in favor of back button focus, back button focus is you can go between autofocus and manual focus easily, but not sure if that's the best reason to do it. Yeah, I, I mean, it depends on how you turn off your manual focus, I guess, Jeff, would be my thought, uh, is that, uh, you know, on my big lens, I can just there's a switch on the side of the lens. I can just turn it off. And so uh, it's not really a, for me, it's not a matter of which button on the back of the camera I need to push. If I, if I understand you correctly. And then uh, Doug says you haven't discussed dual back button with an R5. You have both standard focus and eye focus. And then with dual back button, you're probably right too. But then again, if, if I'm, my point is, if I'm having to relegate my thumb to just one function, I'm taking away all those other functions. If I understand you right, Doug, and that's that's the reason why I prefer the uh, for my for my focus finger to be the same as my trigger finger ultimately. But I love these comments, so thanks for sending them in. By the way, because you know, again, my mind could be changed. I I don't, you know, I, I I talk about photography and I compare it to golf all the time and say the best golfers in the world play the game knowing they'll never play it perfectly and that's the way photography is to me i mean if someone tells me i can use a different driver and play the game better i'm gonna listen and so that's why i love these comments because i may have it wrong and so that's why all these things are debatable there's not hard and fast rules on, on how you should do things and that's why i like hearing everybody's comments because i may be doing it wrong i've learned things along the way from other people uh, either before I started doing some tours of backcountry journeys and even after, you know, because we're all, if you, if you think you're done learning this game, you, then uh, you probably need to find another hobby because there's always something to learn. This, this picture of this Anhinga, that's what I'm talking about. That really out of focus background from uh, with after priority. I know I can guarantee that kind of background every single time. And that's why I love that, that mode. Uh, Bob says, to me, the reason for back button focus is to focus and recompose. Without it, you have to half press the shutter to focus and recompose. But once you've shot one time, then you're refocusing when you take the next shot without back button. Yeah, and if you're if you're using the single point focus mode, Bob, I, I agree with you on that. That is a good reason to use back button focus because you can you can just lock it down and then recompose. But with these newer cameras, in my mind, with these newer cameras, because they do have eye tracking. And they do have continuous focus. There's really no, there's never any need to recompose necessarily. And so I prefer the thing to stay, my lens camera to stay focusing all the time that I can recompose and, uh, and just again, use my bat thumb. But hey, that's why we have these discussions. Noel says he uses three buttons for focus, single point, one for single point, two for group, three for dynamic. It's quick select the one I need. And, uh, Nikon, uh, he uses Nikon. He says that works for him. See, Noel, the reason why it works for you is you're a lot smarter than I am. I would get lost in all those different settings. So I always try to keep my stuff pretty straightforward and pretty simple. And I didn't mention that before. That's a lot of what, what guides my technical settings too, is just to keep it pretty much the same every time I go out. So that way I'm not having to reset my camera every time from a different shoot that I did and really try to keep it straightforward. So when the wildlife does show up, I can react a whole lot quicker instead of having to, you know, and I, I screwed up last week. 
I had my camera set a different way trying to show someone something. I forgot to reset it. And then when the action happened, I missed some shots and, uh, and until I figured out what was going on and I just needed to reset my camera. So, yeah. And then a the great discussion though. That's why we talk about this stuff is just to figure out what everybody else is doing and why it works for you. So we've got about 13 minutes till the end of the hour. I'm going to open this up for more questions. If anybody has any questions about any of the pictures I took, anything I talked about today, what do you think another debatable is that maybe I didn't cover that we should include in this? And, uh, and, uh, Let's let's just talk about it. So here we go. So okay, so Beth says eye track does not always focus on the right thing. I need both spot and eye track. How do you switch fast with just a shutter button for focus? Uh on so Beth, I know what camera you use on mine. I can hit the while I'm looking through the viewfinder, I can hit the Q button and then use the toggle switch to change it off from eye tracking to another mode of focusing. And that's what I do. Uh, and so if that doesn't make sense, just contact me with an email afterwards and uh, we can jump on a zoom and I can help you out with that. But again, that's if, well, I'm looking to the viewfinder on my R5, if I hit the Q button, all those different things I can change on the fly come up then I can just adjust the setting right then. Uh, we got a few more questions coming in. Thanks for sending these things. Let me look. Oops. Hang on a second. Oh, that's a good one, Susan. Filters, ND and or polarizing. Well, it, you know, each one is for a different is for a different uh, application. Uh, ND filter is just is a broad range of explaining this. ND filters are typically used for if you're shooting video in bright sunlight. They're good for that, but they're also good if you're trying to shoot water in brighter in uh, brighter light. So that way, you're trying to get that really slow shutter speed to get that uh, real smooth, milky effect in the water. And so if, it, if you're shooting, again, if you're shooting in bright, you need to be able to cut that light out. And so an ND filter works to just to cut the amount of light that's reaching the sensor in the end. Uh, there's also another ND filter, I think probably has a lot of application for landscape photography, and that's a graduated neutral density. Now you can do that in post-processing, but it's also nice to see what it looks like in the field. But a graduated neutral density, if you think about your, windshield on your vehicle how it's tinted at the top and it gradually becomes clear that's what a graduated neutral density filter does and its application would be as such like last week when we're shooting the smoky mountains the sky is a little bit brighter than the mountains but by using that that neutral density part in the sky you can more easily balance the exposure so that way you're not blowing out the sky and, or making the mountains too dark you can really balance that exposure and get the get the sky properly exposed as well as the mountains in the foreground and then a polarizing filter is usually used just to cut the glare off of uh, off of water or even the leaves off of the glare that comes off leaves and landscape of, of trees. And typically polarizers work best if you're shooting at a 90 degree angle from the sun. And so, uh, or about a 90 degree angle from the sun. And it kind of, that's just a general term. But if you're shooting directly away from the sun or towards the sun, they don't work as good. So if you're kind of any angle, they work in varying degrees based on the angle you are from the sun. So uh, they're just two different tools for different things. Uh, Susan says that she used the variable ND to adjust quickly from shooting wildlife from within the woods to open sky, but heard not, but heard not really used correctly. Yeah, I mean, usually for me, and this is just how I work, I don't use the uh, uh, ND filter for wildlife at all. I just, I think that application is more for a landscape application. Uh, but, you know, it, it's even the variable part, even though it may go to zero, I, I think it, it just works best. And, and it's a little simpler workflow if you just use, uh, if you use just a, uh, if you use just no filter at all. And then uh, Alan sends in the question, in Nikon, you need your trigger finger to change the ISO and exposure compensation. Yeah, that is true. And so, uh, like I said earlier, a lot of what I'm talking about is kind of centered around how I use my Canon cameras. It may or may not apply to all the uh, all the different different things. So I appreciate that comment, Alan. And I don't, I don't know if in the newer Nikons, the, the like the Z7 or the Z9, 
if you can change, I haven't used them uh, enough to know if you can change the reprogram the buttons to do exposure compensation somewhere else. But yeah, like you say on the, on the Nikon, that plus minus sign for exposure compensation is up by your fingers. See, you have to take it. So in that case, back button focus probably would be a better solution for how you use your camera. Uh, Izzy says, we've got a lot of good questions coming in. Izzy says, primarily a landscape photographer and exclusively use the back button focus. I'm curious, how does it work with continuous focus in sports and wildlife? If you're talking about back button focus, it'll it'll work the same uh, in continuous focus in sports and wildlife. And then Linda says, do you use histogram for exposure compensation? Not really, uh, because that histogram in a lot of outdoor scenarios will lie to you. A lot of what I do is by experience. I just know that if it's a, uh, if it's a dark background, the camera is going to tend to overexpose the image. And so I've just got to, I've got to, if, since it's overexposing, it, it's putting too much light on the sensor. I need to take light away. So I'm on a minus exposure compensation. And then if it's, if the, if it's a bright background, like snow, it's the camera is going to tend to underexpose it. And so, since it's underexposed, it's too dark. I need to add light or a plus ex exposure compensation. And that's usually the way I think about it, but that becomes muscle memory after time. So I really don't use the, I mean, I bet I, this is no lie. I bet I use a histogram less than, I bet I use it less than 1% of the time I take pictures. I mean, I'll look at it sometimes after the fact when I'm looking at Lightroom, but when I'm in the field, I just never use it. And a lot of that's just, I've done a lot and you just kind of become comfortable in the way you do things and you just you, you understand that over time and i talk about this a lot of times and this sounds so simplistic in every case the camera is going to do one of three things when it comes to exposure it's either going to get the exposure right it's going to overexpose or underexpose can't do anything else one of those three things it's going to do almost or it's going to do that every single time i'll say it again get the exposure right overexpose or underexpose and so the more you can build in your mind those scenarios that the camera is going to get it right, or if it's going to underexpose it, like I said, in the case of a uh, snow, or if it's going to overexpose it in the case of a dark shadowy background, if you know that ahead of time, you can kind of predict how much exposure compensation you're going to need. And usually it doesn't, you know, I talked about that earlier, and this was part of a webinar I did earlier too. I talked about that photo statistica, and I learned that of the 640,000 images I've ever taken, about 80,000 of them. Were, were shot using exposure compensation. And of those 80,000 images that I use exposure compensation, probably, and this is a this is a guess, but it's a pretty close guess. I can't remember the exact number. Something like 92% were within the realm of either being plus one or minus one or somewhere in between. So in other words, even though your camera will show a plus two or a plus three or a minus two and a minus three on exposure compensation, very rarely in my experience have I seen where you need to go outside of a plus or a minus one. So, and then knowing all those things in my head, it's just, you know, we go back to that map I showed. That's, that's how I calculate my best route from point A to point B. Uh, and then let's see, Susan says filters reduce lens glass technology in general. I, I think they can. I mean, even though you can buy the best quality filters, I think anytime you put something in front of the native glass that comes with that lens, we may not be able to perceive it, but it's going to degrade that image to some degree. It's it's it has to. And so, uh, I, you know, and the question becomes, can you perceive how much it degrades the image or not? I'm sure somebody can measure that. But for all practical purposes, the purposes that most of us are going to use our pictures for, you probably can't tell the difference is my guess. Uh, let me look. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. And then Izzy says, graduated ND filter is okay if a straight horizon, correct? Yeah, but if trees or branches are in the sky area, it'd also be dark. And exactly right, Izzy. Uh, Mark says, do you have a metering mode you prefer for wildlife? Uh, spot center weighted, et cetera. In Canon, it's kind of a center weighted mode called evaluative metering. And that's the metering mode I use the most. Uh, I think it, you know, it, and again, it goes back to my simplistic workflow of always being ready to take pictures. And I'm telling you, when I'm at home, I've got a, my, a camera on my 500 millimeter lens and it's set ready to go because I live out in the country. And so there's never know when you look outside what you're going to see. Saw a bobcat yesterday. Didn't take a picture of it, but I saw it. 
he was a little bit too far away, but you never know what you're going to see out here. So I'm always having everything ready. So in the interest of, of streamlining my workflow and always knowing it's on the ready, I've just adopted that I'm always going to have my, my metering set the same way to evaluative metering. And I understand how the camera is going to either get it right or get it wrong on that metering. Uh, and so I, I know by what I said, the, what I just said previously in terms of exposure compensation, I'm always going to have my metering set. I'm always going to have my ISO set right. I'm always going to have my aperture set right. And so really all I've got to do is if I see, if I look outside right now, I'm staring outside to my side yard. If I look outside right now and I see a big white tail buck standing out there, all I've got to do is turn my camera on and it's ready to roll. I'm not having to unthink what I've done in the past because every time I give myself the chance to try something, a new setting or new technique I'm not used to, I always end up screwing something up right after that. So, and again, this is all in the, in the context of wildlife photography because those things happen so fast. Now, a lot of these things are give and take if you're talking about other genres of nature photography, but wildlife photography where seconds really do matter. I'm just trying to figure out a way to get from point A to point B the absolute quickest I can to ultimately be able to get the shot. Uh, Linda says, thoughts on lens hood. And Doug, I see your question. It's coming up. My thoughts on lens hoods are they're too dadgum expensive. That's what I think. Uh, I think lens hoods are valuable to use. I know they do take up space, but the lens hood is going to do a couple of key things for you. Number one, it's, well, three key things for you, actually. And uh, let me, I'm going to slide off here right quick and grab a lens. So this is a 500 millimeter lens with a, with the lens hood on it. And you can see, you can take it off there. And I know it is cumbersome because it's a big piece on the end. And I say they're too dadgum expensive because I think if I had to go buy one of these new, I think they're about $600. For just the lens hood but here's the one thing it does number one if you're carrying this thing through the brush and limbs are kind of slapping against it you're protecting your glass from being able to get scratched up and stuff so they're they're valuable in that number, and, and in the same sense uh we had a guest drop his camera on a trip and it landed on the lens hood and the lens hood and the filter took all the abuse uh but the lens was fine in the end so it provided a shock absorber when his lens fell off his tripod because it did it it just hammered straight down and broke the lens hood, but the lens was fine. And so lens hoods can be replaced. The lenses are a little harder to do. It stings a little more. Number two, I think if you're in dusty areas, it, you know, if dust is the ambient dust is kind of falling straight down, it protects from dust. And then number three, uh, which isn't so much of a big deal for a big telephoto lens. But the number three thing is when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, lens flare, it does help on lens flare. So I thought they're a good idea. And then, uh, Thoughts on lens extenders, like if teleconverters, I think is what you mean. Linda, ask again uh, on the second part question. I, I use a 1.4 teleconverter a lot. I think it's a, a really, really, really sh sharp with my lens. It's a match teleconverter, so it's a Canon lens and a Canon teleconverter, and so they're made to work together. I'm not so crazy about the 2X teleconverter. The 2X I have is soft after you get it doesn't even have to be a far distance, but after you get, I don't even know the distance, but after you get out a certain ways, it becomes soft. It does have a sweet spot that, you know, between, and I've shot a lot of cover pictures with that setup, but between, uh, uh, you know, say 10 meters, the close focusing distance and about midway out on the focusing distance, it's really, the 2X is sharp there, but beyond that, it's not very sharp. So a good compromise for me is the 1.4 extender. It's a lot sharper. And uh, it works really well. Those lenses that I know Olympus has one that has the integrated, I think they have an integrated teleconverter on that. I know a lot of ca cameras are coming out with that in integrated teleconverter. Nikon has a new lens coming out. Canon has a lens like that coming out. They, they, they you don't, you're going to lose sharpness like when you put a filter on, but I really don't think it's so discernible that if you're sharing, if you're making 20 by 30 prints on your wall or you're sharing pictures on Facebook that, it's going to even be discernible. So I, I also like that. And oh, yeah, Mark says the lens hood keeps the rain off the lens. I forgot about that one, but that's a good point, Mark. And so the tele extenders I like, but here's a conversation we had a couple of weeks ago on a trip. You get to a point where no matter how good the teleconverter is, or no matter how good the lens is, or no matter how good the camera is, 
there's still some best practices you use to ensure sharp images. And one, I, talk, I, I beat it to death, but use some kind of support will help a lot. But number two is you can't expect on a day like today when it's sunny outside and the sun's high in the sky for me to, I mean, that's for me to see that bobcat all the way across the pasture and me take a picture picture and expect a reasonably sharp image because you've got the heat bubbles that are coming off the land. And then in the atmosphere, there's just dirt, dirt in the air that you can't see. But when your lens is looking through all that dirt, uh, it becomes less and less sharp over distance. So you still got the best practices of trying to get as close as you can to the animal and uh, trying to uh, uh, just fill the frame as much as you can. Use your legs primarily for the zoom instead of relying all on the technology because every, anytime you have to zoom in on a picture to, to uh, and we all do it, but anytime you have to really crop in on a picture, you're going to lose sharpness because you're shooting at too far of a distance. And then Doug, I see your question here. I use a combination of experience and the EVF showing the changes I adjust the exposure compensation. That's kind of what I do there with the, especially with the R5. But when I'm still using some of my old DSLRs, uh, uh, it's uh, I still I still kind of use that more experience because I don't have that that uh, that to be I can't see the live changes as they go online inside there uh Beth says she wants to use her legs more but there are distance rules that is true when you go in national parks and you know you do have to keep keep distances sometimes on how far that you got to be away from animals and that's that's always understandable hey i'm going to show you a picture right quick because i'll tell you what i usually don't don't really or at least i hope i don't come across as bragging on myself but i'm going to show you a picture here in a minute but i if you know me, you know I love telling stories. And so I got to tell you a story. This farm I bought, we closed on it in 2009. And, uh, or 2019, I'm sorry. And it was, so we've owned it. Uh, we closed on it in December 2019. So essentially, we've owned a little over two years. And in the ensuing time, if you ever look at any of the videos I do, I'll come out with uh, videos on wildlife conservation. Because for me, and it's, and it's the way I've been since I've been... Uh, had the means and the opportunity to do it to me every day is, is earth day. And so I try to do something either I'm thinking about some kind of wildlife conservation project, or I'm doing some kind of wildlife conservation project on my own property. And last Sunday, my brother called me and said that, Hey, I just think I saw this certain species over on your property. You need to go check it out. And so I went over there and looked, and almost, this is a picture of my phone of the back on my phone of the back of my camera, but there's a bobwhite quail right there. And what's significant about them is for the past 30 years, those are all they're, they're, they've been functionally extinct around here. I mean, there's just not many left. And the fact that all that conservation work I'm doing and planting and food plots and sculpting the land and, and just trying to do all the things that are right for wildlife conservation. Uh, I've got those quail, that somewhere there's a there's a little bit of a seed population left, but they're all starting to come onto my property now, and uh, I'm pretty excited about that. So, with that said, I appreciate the conversation we had today. I really loved all the comments I got, and uh, if you think of something else later on, don't let it stop here. Stay in touch. There's my uh, email address, russell at russellgraves.com. And as anybody can tell you, uh, I almost always. Uh, or as anybody can tell you, I may not be able to do it right away, but I always respond to emails when you send them. And every now and then I will, uh, I'll give you a call back if it seems, or a Zoom meeting back, if that seems to be the best way to do it. So my point is my door is an open door. And uh, if you need anything, please feel free to stay in touch. Uh, I've got a few comments coming in. Thanks, Linda, for your comments. Thanks, Beth. Alan, appreciate that. Always good to see you when we go out. And uh, Noel, same same to you. It's always good to see you guys when, whenever we get to go out in the field together. So, uh, yeah, if you need anything else, just feel free to reach out. I appreciate everyone's time today and uh, take care.